Well, I wonder this morning how many of you enjoy going to the dentist? You volunteers? No. I think that's pretty universal. A lot of things that, you know, everyone's divided and split in different opinions. I think we're all unified that nobody likes going to the dentist. I wonder how many of you, please don't raise your hands. I don't want to know about your dental hygiene and your dental health. This is a rhetorical question. Answer it to yourself privately. But I wonder how many of you have sat in a dentist chair and had a dentist tell you what you are not doing up to the standard as far as your dental hygiene. And I got, I got some of the uh, micro expressions there of uh, certainly some people have experienced that. You sit in that chair and, and that can go a lot of different ways. A lot of times the, the kinder dentists, they'll sit and they'll begin by asking you some questions. So how, how often do you brush your teeth? Uh, tell me about your flossing habits. And that's that moment where all of us have to confront that sin nature, which immediately said, well, you know, I, you know, I might skip a day here or there, but definitely, you know, two, three times a day normally. And uh, I'm on top of that. And, and we have a tendency to maybe exaggerate a little bit how well we take care of things. But over the course of a dentist visit, what will happen is that dentist will look in your mouth. They'll analyze what's going on. They'll assess the problems. They'll explain to you, this is bad. This is real bad, and here's why it's real bad. It's normally uh, something you haven't been doing that you're supposed to be doing. And at the end of that visit, thankfully, they don't just walk out after saying, this is real bad. If you have a good dentist, they're going to follow it up with, here is what needs to happen if you want this situation to change. They're going to give you a prescription, not for medicine, but for what you need to do after you leave that dentist's office so that the next time you go back and see the dentist, you don't get the same report. And I'll, I'll make a confession to you all. When I was in my early 20s, uh, I was not uh, one who liked getting those reports from the dentist. Uh, I, you know, the standard thing that that dentist would always tell me was, well, here's the deal, Andrew. You're doing a great job brushing your teeth, but your flossing is seriously subpar and your gums are going to be wrecked if you don't fix it. Uh, and I ignored that for a long time. I didn't, didn't like that. But here's the, the, the point I'm trying to make. That dentist can accurately assess, assess what's going on in your mouth. They can explain why it is the way it is. They can tell you exactly what needs to happen to fix it. But at that point, it's up to you. There's some action, some decisions, some commitment required on your part for that dentist's uh, opinion and advice and recommendation to do you any good at all. Now, we're in the book of Haggai. We have been for a couple of weeks now. And you can begin turning to Haggai chapter number one. And I want you to think of it this way as we get ready to look at our passage for this morning. God has had the Jews in the dentist chair as we go through Haggai chapter one. And God has been asking his people some questions about their habit patterns and about how they've been approaching their life. One of the questions he asked in verse number four is, is it time? You to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste. There was a building project going on. God's people had come from Babylon to rebuild God's house, to reconstruct the temple. But some opposition had arisen. That work had ground to a halt, and it had been 16 years since that foundation had been laid. These people had gone. They had built their houses. They had their uh, custom mansions with all the upgrades, and uh, they were living in comfort in the sealed houses. Uh, that just meant they had kind of nice uh, wood paneling on their, on their ceilings and on the walls. And God said, what about my house? He began to ask them some questions and not a pleasant time. It's kind of like a visit to the dentist if you read Haggai chapter number one. Not a, not a comforting conversation. He points out some things to them. He asks them questions, but then he also explains why things are the way they are in their life. And as he began to poke and as he began to prod and as he began to examine their lives, Here's what God pointed out that was going on in the Jews' lives. You eat, but you're not filled. You have clothes to wear, but those clothes are not keeping you warm. You have a paycheck, but that paycheck seemingly is just going into a bag with holes and, and it's not making ends meet. And nothing is really satisfying and nothing is really doing the job in your life. Ask me why. That's what God says. Why do you think that is? And he gives them the answer. He said, here's why things are the way they are in your life. It's because my house is lying waste and you all are running to your houses. 
You're worried about your crops. You're worried about your affairs. You're worried about your calendar and your schedule. And my house is sitting there framed out with the, the Tyvek house wrap. And it's been sitting there for 16 years. And that house wrap is tattered and the, uh, the, the frame is starting to decay and it's weathered and, and colored with age because it's been deserted by my people. Look with me if you would. Let's go ahead and stand out of reverence for God's word. We're going to read this morning Haggai 1 and verse number 12. And we're going to focus this morning on the people's response to that visit to the dentist that they've had at the beginning of the chapter. And here's the title this morning. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Let's look at their response. Haggai 1 verse number 12. The Bible says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. A lot of different ways you can respond when God examines you and tells you what the problem is and tells you how to fix it. And what we'll see here, thankfully, we have a positive example to study. We have a, a, a good example to follow. And what we find is that God's exams and God's diagnosis and God's prescription of what's going on in our life, it is only profitable when we fear him, when we obey him, when we let him stir us, and when we come to his house and do the work. That's what we're going to see as we study this morning. Heavenly Father, I simply ask for your help that it would not just be... Uh, me speaking my words this morning, but that your message and your words would be conveyed out of your Bible to your people this morning. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. There's really three components, and you've got these on your outline on the back of your bulletin this morning, three aspects of the people's response to God's dental chair that we're going to see here. And, and praise the Lord, I enjoy studying the positive examples, the uh, good things that we see. We see, first of all, their compliance. Haggai was used of God to examine them, to ask them questions about what was going on, to ask them and urge them to consider their ways. He uses that phrase twice. Haggai's used by God to point out to them why they're having the issues that they're having. God took credit for the financial problems, for the economic problems that they were dealing with, God said, you brought things home and I did blow upon it. You scurried around and tried to gather up your harvest and you tried to work overtime and you uh, tried to save and invest and you brought all that back to your house and God told them, I just went, that's all it took. And all your labors are in vain when I was actively opposing you but God didn't leave it there. He didn't walk out of the office after that point. He told them in verse number eight how to fix the problem. He said, go up to the mountain, bring wood, and build the house. God told them exactly what they needed to do to fix it. Haggai delivered that message. And I want you to see, first of all, that the people complied. It says in verse number 12 that they obeyed. And it also says that they did fear before the Lord. And the first step, when you have a situation in your life where God has revealed to you that there's a problem, where God has revealed to you where there's something lacking in your life, where God has revealed to you that your circumstances uh, may be a storm of correction. We've talked about this before, that not every storm that God sends in our life is a storm of correction. Reference Job, chapter number one. He was perfect and upright, feared God to shoot evil. Uh, God did not punish Job by sending those trials in his life. He allowed those things to come. But some storms are a storm of correction. And that's what God has told these people here in Haggai 1. He said, I did this. I called for a drought. I did blow upon it. And step one, when God 
gives us a diagnosis like that is this. We have to listen and fear God enough to actually change our plan. We have to fear God enough to actually decide I'm going to do something different based on what God has told me. Now, there's a lot of wrong ways that we could uh, respond to this. And I, as you think through everything that's detailed in the Old Testament, if you didn't have verses 12 through 15, I think a lot of us could have filled out the end of the story based on what we know of the character of the Israelites. And I'm not demeaning the Israelites. This is human nature. This is how we all are. But if you didn't have verses 12 to 15, a lot of us could have done a uh, write your own ending to Haggai chapter 1 based on the precedent that's set throughout the rest of the Bible. And we probably wouldn't come to the conclusion of what is written here. Because our tendency and our nature, just as it was with the Israelites, it's the same way with us, is not to hear God's diagnosis and say, all right, if that's the answer, aye, aye, sir, I understand and will obey. That's not what comes naturally to us to do. And so when God tells you something that's wrong in your life, when God tells you, in this case, you've been misprioritizing your house over my house, that's the specific charge in this case, here's some things that we should ensure is not our response. Look over at Zechariah chapter number 7. It's just the next book to the right. Zechariah chapter number 7. Zechariah was a prophet who was a contemporary of Haggai, so he's living in the exact same point in history. He was uh, Haggai's... um, fellow laborer, if you will, in the prophetic ministry. I want you to see one of the responses to correction that these prophets saw and that God recognized in his people. Zechariah 7 and verse number 11. The Bible says in this case that they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not here. And if you're a student of the Bible, you would recognize phrases like that all throughout the Old Testament. Places like Isaiah chapter number 6. People who heard what God had to say, but deliberately chose to ignore the things that God was pointing out in their life. Here's the analogy, and again, confessional time for me. Nobody else need confess anything, but uh, I had a conversation with my wife at some point in the recent past. We were driving, and you're coming up to a stoplight, and there's a yellow light. And you go, I can make it. I can make it, I can do this, I can get there before the red light turns. And here's something that I may or may not have spoken to my wife about. Well, if I don't see it turn red, then I'm pretty sure it didn't happen. If I don't look at the light, then the last time I saw it, it was yellow. And so that's totally legal. Uh, And here's what we do with God's word. God has instructions that tell us there's something that's not right in your life. There are some commandments that are being broken. There are some priorities that are out of order. And here's our tendency. None of us would do this physically. None of us would do this explicitly. But in our hearts, we can sit in church on a Sunday morning and we can look straight at the preacher and we can scribble notes in our uh, notebook and in our hearts be going, ah, la, 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 I can't hear you. I didn't see the red light. That would be the wrong response. And this is, again, this is, Uh, Not what we read in Haggai 1, but this is the natural tendency that we have when we get corrected. Look back, if you would, with me at 2 Chronicles chapter 36. 2 Chronicles 36. I'm trying to show you how remarkable the response that is here is, because it's not the normal response. 2 Chronicles 36 In Haggai, what has happened is that the nation of Judah has gone into captivity because of their sin. After 50 years, Cyrus allowed them to return to rebuild their destroyed city and their destroyed temple. And in 2 Chronicles, we're going back to the initial event, the whole reason that they got sent to Babylon in the first place. And it was because of their response to God putting them in the dentist chair and having a prophet say, there's some things that are out of order in your life. Look at 2 Chronicles 36 and verse number 14. The Bible says, Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. I just want to stop there and point out this. When we do wrong in God's eyes, it is amazing the amount of times that is associated with and connected to our relationship with God's house or the lack thereof. Sometimes we have this idea that I have my Christian life 
and I have my relationship with God, and then in a separate container, and in a separate box, and in a separate lane, I have my church life, and what I do at church, and my church attendance, and my church participation. God ties those things as uh, inextricably linked. Your relationship with God is directly connected to your relationship with God's house. And so for someone to say, I love God, and I walk with God, and uh, I am in a relationship with God, but I don't go to his house, it doesn't work that way. That's a contradiction in terms, and God ties their sin to their pollution of his house here in 2 Chronicles 36. Look at verse number 15. Look how God responded to the problems that the nation was having. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers. That's what Haggai was called. He's a messenger. Rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. There's that emphasis on God's house. Here's their response to the message. They mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. God's people, this is the whole reason they got into the bad situation in the first place. The whole reason they went into captivity is because God put them in the dentist chair and said, you've got issues with your brushing. You've got issues with your flossing. You've got bad dental hygiene. You've got bad spiritual hygiene. And they looked at the dentist. They looked at the dental hygienist and mocked. Said, who are you to tell me how to live my life? Who are you to tell me how I should be brushing my teeth? Who are you to tell me I have to floss a certain way? And the God that was compassionate upon them and wanted to heal them and wanted to help them when they refused to listen to his message says his wrath was kindled. And ultimately he allowed his own house to be destroyed and his own people to be sent into captivity in Babylon because they misused and uh, mocked the messenger. Paul put it this way in the New Testament, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Sometimes we find ourselves having that kind of an attitude, although, again, we, we would never put it that way. Here's another wrong way that we can hear God's assessment of our spiritual hygiene. We can hear the solution, but refuse to let go of the status quo. So here's how this plays out. God, through Haggai, told the people, listen, there is a solution. You've been prioritizing your house over my house. So the answer to that, the fix for it, the way that you remedy this situation is go up to the mountain. Remember we looked at that, we, we use this phrase, take a hike. I'm not going to have you just uh, order Amazon Prime lumber anymore. I want you to go up to the mountain. I want you to go seek out building materials for my house. I want you to go find somebody that you can bring and uh, make them a part of my house. I want you to bring that lumber and I want you to build the house. I want you to be part of the construction crew. That was the uh, uh, instruction that God gave them. And here's the debate. And here's the battle that raged in their minds and that rages in our mind and in our heart. God points out something. God sends a passage out of the scripture in your daily reading. Or God uses a, a portion of a sermon to speak and address an area of your life. And we can go, okay, I know that's a problem. I know I should fix that. And, it, and maybe it, it has a hold of us for a couple of hours or it has a hold of us for a day or two and then we go home and Monday morning hits and Tuesday morning hits and by the time we come to church on Thursday night that's gone on we acknowledge sure there's a problem but we're already back busy in our routine of sowing and reaping and earning wages and, and trying to put it into the bag and we've already forgotten it's not that we disagree with the solution it's just that we don't have time for the solution that's the whole issue in Haggai chapter 1 God said is it time because the people's uh, profession in, I believe it's verse number three, the time is not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. You remember, here's what the Jews had been saying. I am all for God's house being built. That's something that should happen. God's house should be built. I just can't be a part of it right now. I just can't fit that into my schedule this week. I just can't do that. Tonight's not a good night for me. And God told them, is it time? Is it time for you to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? And so we procrastinate and we refuse to let go of the status quo and actually change something. But thankfully, in this case, we have a positive example. 
Verse number 12 of Haggai chapter 1. Go back to Haggai 1 if you're not there. The Bible says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, here's the key words, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Two things I want you to see in Haggai 1 and verse number 12. First of all, you have a time word that begins that verse. It says, then. Then. This is what we've been talking about. Our problem often is that we hear God's instruction. We sit in the dentist's chair. We get told, you need to do a better job flossing. You need to do a better job brushing. You need to get a different kind of brush. You need to change your routine, change your schedule. You need to adjust this. You need to adjust that. And we agree with it. Yep, you're right. You went to school for X number of years to study teeth. You probably know how it should work. That's right. Yep, I should be doing that. And I go home and maybe I floss for a day. And then Tuesday rolls around and I'm in a hurry. And Wednesday rolls around and I don't have time for that. It says then. As soon as they heard the message, as soon as they got the instruction. They began to obey. They began to follow those directions. There was a timeliness. There was a promptness with that. I want you to see this. Secondly, in verse number 12, the order of who obeyed God's commands. Who obeyed God's commands. Three times in Haggai chapter 1, these two men are mentioned. Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. For the purposes of this morning's message, all I need you to understand is that these two men had leadership roles in this group of people. One of them's the governor, one of them's the high priest. You've got a civil leader and you've got a religious leader in this case. And when the Bible says that these people obeyed what God had told them to do, it starts by telling us that the leadership of that group of people obeyed what God wanted them to do. And so I would say this this morning to everyone who is a husband, who is a father, who is a mother, who is an employer, who is a pastor, anyone who's in a leadership role of any kind, you cannot expect the people that you are responsible for to begin obeying God's instructions and obeying God's commands if you are not first setting that example in your life. Uh, We've heard it put this way, and I forget who this quote is attributed to, but uh, he who would learn how to command must first learn how to obey. If you don't know how to obey, you don't know how to lead. And so in this case, you have a man named Zerubbabel and a man named Joshua. And if you look back at uh, verse number one, you'll find that Haggai's instruction actually first was addressed to the leadership. And so if there's a problem in your family, men, it's going to start with you. Parents, it's going to start with you. If there's a problem in a church, pastor, that's going to start with me. And God uh, directs that and says, listen, I want the people. The command is not only for the leaders. But Zerubbabel and Joshua had to lead the way. Zerubbabel and Joshua had to take that first step and say, there's an issue here in this group of people. There's an issue. We've been slack. We have misprioritized our houses over God's house. And we need to fix that. And so Zerubbabel and Joshua lead the way and they begin to set the example. We won't turn there, but you see this principle throughout the Bible when Jonah went and preached in Nineveh. Very different situation. You have a Jew here preaching to a bunch of Gentiles, a bunch of heathens, and he's essentially giving them God's analysis after putting the city of Nineveh in the dentist chair. And if you remember, Jonah's message was simply this, 40 days and Nineveh Nineveh shall be destroyed. Jonah was used of God to to look in Assyria's mouth, if you will, and say, yeah, this is real bad. This is all going to fall apart. And I'm not here to preach Jonah this morning, but if you read Jonah chapter 3, here's what you'll find. It was the king of Nineveh said, we've got to take this seriously. We've got to respond to this right now. We're not going to wait till day 39 to fix this. He proclaimed a fast. He led his people in repenting from what they had had wrong in their life that God analyzed and that God diagnosed. Look back at Haggai 1 and verse number 12. The last part of the verse says this, that the people did fear before the Lord. The people did fear before the Lord. We have a tendency, I I use we very broadly, those who claim to be Christians, we have a tendency to overemphasize the love and compassion and grace of God to the exclusion of the fear of God. 
It's not two different gods. It's not two different Jesuses. I've said this many times. The Jesus of Revelation 19 is the same Jesus of the gospel. The Jesus of compassion and love and healing is the same Jesus who will rule with the rod of iron, who will judge righteous judgment. And that's the picture of God that the people of Haggai's day needed to have. Not just a God who is compassionate and loving, though he is, but a God who is to be feared. There's nothing wrong with fearing God. In fact, the Bible would tell us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's a wise thing. It's a healthy thing to be afraid of disobeying God. See, here's what Haggai told them. You started to notice some symptoms here and there in your life. You started to see some things that maybe you can't put your finger on, but you know that something's not quite right. Because you're going out and you've got the best farm equipment and you've got the best topsoil and you've got the best irrigation system and you put the most sweat equity into your farm and yet something keeps coming up short. You've got a good job and you've got a good paycheck and you bring that home and you put it in your account and you look the next day and it's gone. Something's going wrong. And then he goes on and says, God did that. God is actively opposing you because you are misprioritizing and you're putting your house as more important than his house. And God is against you. That's God's word through Haggai. It's okay to be afraid when that's the message that you receive from God. The Bible talks in the book of Jude about uh, saving people with fear. I don't know what your personal testimony is. When you came to trust Christ, in my case, I was scared of God. That's why I got saved. I was afraid of getting thrown into hell for my sin. And the result of that fear was I got saved. That fear was a healthy thing. That was a good thing. And here the Bible correlates their obedience to their fear. And, and I'm not trying to insert or interpolate what God's word has to say, but if I am a head of a household in that nation, I hear Haggai preaching those things. Here's what starts to run through my mind. If God's willing to take my wages and let them drop out the holes, and if God's willing to let me eat and still be hungry, and if God's willing to let me have clothes and not be warm, what else is God willing to do? The whole reason we're here rebuilding a ruined temple is because God finally had enough. I don't want to let this go until the point where God's had enough. So that people feared, and that fear led them to obedience. You sit back in a dentist chair, and ultimately... I had, uh, I'm not going to take any shots at military dentists. I'll just say this. <laughs> I had a good dentist at one point who finally explained to me, you know, a lot of dentists over the years, again, this is my early 20s, and I didn't think it was important. Had a lot of dentists who just say, hey, you need to floss better. I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever. I hear that every, every six months or hear that every year. Finally, I had a dentist who sat down and said, there's some things you should be afraid of in your dental health. This could lead to you losing your teeth. And that fear was a healthy thing in my life. It maybe uh, drove me to make some changes in my daily habit patterns because I was afraid of what would happen if I did not make the necessary corrections. That's what's happened in the book of Haggai. That's the way it should be in our lives. Again, it's okay to be afraid of disobeying God. God's loving. God's compassionate. God's long-suffering. And he's righteous. And he has a point where he won't put up with it anymore, even for his people. It's okay to be afraid of that. You'll notice that they were not afraid before Haggai. And so the job is not, oh, what does pastor think? Oh, I don't want pastor to be upset about this. It's not about Haggai. Haggai is literally just a mouthpiece. They are feared before the Lord. That's who their fear was of. We see, secondly, not just their compliance, their obedience, and their fear, but we see the cooperation that is offered. And just as suddenly as you have the then of verse number 12, verse 13 also starts with then. In verse number 12, what we saw is that as soon as Haggai finished delivering his message, then the people obeyed. Verse 13 tells us that as soon as the people obeyed, then, directly following, then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up 
the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. A couple of things that we need to understand from verse number 13. Haggai was used by God to deliver both reproof and comfort. You need a balanced spiritual diet. You can't only have comfort. There needs to be reproof. But the only reason that Haggai's counsel and Haggai's prophecy was valid is because it was in the Lord's message. Verse number 13. And I'll preach it myself for a moment. Preaching from the word of God is not about pastor standing up and riding a hobby horse. Here's the things that really tick me off. Here's what really grinds my gears. Here's what I don't like. The only time my preaching will be effective, the only time my preaching will be profitable to anybody is if it's in the Lord's message. And as you go throughout the book of Haggai, we've not had time to study this in depth, but here's what you see. In a short book of only two chapters, it's something like 12 or 15 or 20 times the Bible emphasizes it's God's word by the mouth of Haggai. The Lord said by Haggai the prophet. The Lord's message by the messenger Haggai. And so this does not only apply to a pastor or preacher, but certainly that's been the application in my life. What I have to say only matters if it's in the Lord's message. And let me tell you this, what you have to say only matters if it's in the Lord's message. And so God uses Haggai to deliver not just reproof in the first half of the chapter, but now Haggai has the, the privilege, and I just uh, assuming some things about human nature, I suspect Haggai was a lot happier to deliver this message. I am with you saith the Lord. I am with you. And I want you to understand, again, God is not love or anger. God is not uh, mercy or truth. It's not either or, it's yes and. And the same God that said, I am actively opposing you. There's some things you need to fix. There's some things that are wrong in your life. That same God in the same breath says, here's how you can fix it. Here's how you can change it. Go up to the mountain and, and bring wood and build the house. Here's what you need to do to go about. And, and now he says, I am with you. He gives the solution and he offers all the needed support and resources to accomplish what he has directed you to do. And so a good dentist, after saying, here's what you need to change in your daily and weekly habits, will follow that up by saying, here's the tools required. Here's the resources Here's the kind of floss to buy. Here's the toothbrush you need. Here's the, you know, here's a diagram. Here's a video. Here's some educational materials, whatever it is. And God here says, it's not just about you messed up. Go fix it. So as soon as you decide to obey, as soon as you start to fear me, as soon as that's your heart's desire to put your priorities back in order and prioritize my house, I'll be right there alongside you. I'll be with you. I will cooperate with you. I'll provide what you need because as we'll read in Zechariah, or, or maybe we won't read it this morning. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my spirit, saith the Lord. I'm not asking you to work out and get strong enough and become a good enough builder to go finish the temple. I'm asking you to be willing to obey me and then I will be with you so that you can build the temple, so that uh, I can be glorified. It's important that we understand in verses 12 and 13 the order of operations here. The order of operations the people had to obey before they could receive the comfort that God had to offer from them. So Haggai didn't say, there's a problem. You're misprioritizing. You're treating your house as more important than my house. Here's how to fix it, and I'm with you. No, he left it at, here's what has to happen if you want this situation to change. Once the people obey, once the people feared before the Lord, that's when God said, all right, I'm with you. And here's what we have to understand. We sometimes limit our obedience to uh, once God gives me some comfort, once God gives me some assurance, once God starts to work in my life, then I'll begin to obey him. That's the wrong order. See, we're told to walk by faith, not by sight, which means that our obedience has to precede seeing the working of God. And let me tell you this. We've looked at this in Haggai 1. God did not give them any promises about what was going to happen when they began to build his house. There's not a single word in Haggai chapter 1 about go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house and all your financial problems are going to be solved. 
and all your relationship problems are going to be solved, and all your health problems are going to be solved, and I'll be with you, and we'll reestablish Solomon's kingdom, and life is going to be wonderful. No. He said, go fix this problem. Here's the only promise God gave them. I will be glorified. I will take pleasure in it. That's the only assurance that he gave them. And then when the people said, that's what's important to me. Because that was the only promise God gave them, that means that that was their motivation when they obeyed. They weren't obeying so that God would fix all the problems in their life, because he didn't promise them that. All God said was, build my house, I will be pleased, and I will be glorified. And they said, Lord, that's what we want. I, I, it's not going to be about my fancy house. It's not going to be about my crops. It's not going to be about my time and my schedule. I want you to be pleased. I want you to be glorified. And as soon as they made that choice, God said, I'm with you. I, I'm here. He began to stir the spirits of those individuals. And again, we won't uh, stop here, but it was the leaders uh, who God uh, stirred their spirits first. And you'll see again that God was ready and willing to reverse course immediately from actively opposing them to accompanying them, helping them, supporting them, enabling them as soon as their desire was for his glory and his pleasure. And it says in verse number 14 that the Lord stirred the spirits of these individuals, of Zerubbabel and of Joshua, but also of all the remnant of the people. There was an element of what happened in Haggai 1 that was spiritual and it was supernatural. And here's all I want to point out from that. You can't fake what happened in Haggai 1. You can try and put on the outward appearance. and You can try and say, well, I'm going to go swing a hammer at God's house and I'm going to go do the outward things that will make it look like this is what's happening. But it's only God who can stir someone's spirit. And it's only God who can make a change in someone's heart and in someone's life after he's seen that their desire is to obey and to fear and to please and to glorify him. That's a work that God has to do in someone's life. But if you look at the connection there, there's a direct relationship between verse 13 and verse 14. Verse 13, God said, I am with you. And then their spirits were stirred. So what stirred them, what led to their uh, spirits being reawakened, what led to revival in their life was being reminded of the promise that God was there with them. Now, let's zoom out a little bit. We remember that in Haggai 1, we have no physical building project that Beacon Baptist Church is working on right now. Now, We're not applying this to uh, some piece of land that we need to go build. No. Jesus said, I will build my church. And the church is not a building. The church is the people. And so our building project is to bring people to God's house. To go up to the mountain and find people, and to get people saved, and to get people baptized, and to add those people to the church and build God's house. And when Jesus gave the commands for his disciples to do that, here's the promise he gave them. Go ye and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. It's a building project. And look, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And it's when we lose sight of that promise that we lose our enthusiasm, and instead of being stirred, our hearts to become uh, begin to be settled, and our spirits begin to be cold, and, and we begin to uh, be stagnant when we lose sight of what God has promised, that this is not about your ability, this is not about what you're trying to do, this is about me being with you, working in you, and working through you. And I would just wonder this morning, how long has it been since God stirred your spirit? How long has it been since God moved in your heart? We don't chase emotional experiences. That's not what we depend upon. That's not the foundation that we rest upon. But there are certainly times and seasons in our life where you know God is doing a work in your heart. And if that hasn't been the case in your life, I wonder, uh, I'm not here to diagnose, I'm not the dentist, but I wonder, is it because you've got things out of order? You're chasing that emotional experience and you're chasing the, the tears and the, you know, the, the uh, sounds like just angels are saying, God pointed this out to me. No, it starts with you obeying. It starts with you fearing God. It starts with you deciding whatever's going to please God, whatever's going to glorify God, 
It's not about what the results are for me. If God will be pleased, if God will be glorified, I'm going to get back to work and prioritize God's house over my house. That's when God stirred. The emotions are to follow the work. That's what Proverbs chapter 16 says, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. And we so often we get messed up because we try and chase it the wrong way around and we try and generate some kind of emotional experience and we try and kind of force ourselves to just feel something from God without doing the work of obeying him, without having the mindset of I'm going to please him, I'm going to glorify him. I have to get those things in the right order. And when they did, they obeyed and feared God began to stir in their hearts. Something that no man could do. Haggai couldn't stir their spirits. Zerubbabel couldn't stir their spirits, but God began to do that when they obeyed. Finally, starting in the halfway through verse number 14, we see not just their compliance, not just God's cooperation, but the construction that began to happen. In the middle of verse number 14, it says that they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. And if you look at this paragraph or this section beginning in verse number 12, it's kind of interesting. It almost seems like he's restating something. So verse 12 says, they obeyed. Okay, got it. They began to do what they were supposed to do. But then in verse number 15 or verse 14, excuse me, it's almost like it restates it. It says, they came and did the work. They obeyed. They did the work. Why do we have to say that twice? Well, there's two different aspects of their obedience that, is, that are emphasized here. In verse number 12, their obedience and their fear emphasizes their heart attitude and their decision making. So to obey, yes, there is some action that follows, but ultimately obedience starts when I decide so I am under somebody's authority and I am going to submit and I am going to bend and I am going to comply with that authority that I am under. That's obedience. In verse number 14, what we have is the execution of that decision. See, it's very easy to convince ourselves, yep, I need to do that. Yep, I'm going to uh, change that aspect of my life. I, I can lay that dentist chair and go, ooh, that, that gum disease sounds scary. Oh, uh, that, that horror picture painted by the dentist, that sounds real bad. I'm going to do something. About it. I'm going to obey. Yep, you're right. You're the expert. Uh, I'm going I'm to change all those things. But then do you go home and do the work? Then do you follow through? Do you carry out those commitments that have been made? That's what we see in verse number 14. They not only obeyed, they feared the Lord. They, uh, they said, all right, you're right, Lord. That's, uh, something is wrong in our life. We're going to fix it. And then verse 14 says, and they actually did what they said they were going to do. It's very easy to make a decision on Sunday morning. It's very easy to make a commitment in a revival meeting. It's very easy to say, God, yep, I'm going to do that. It's a lot harder to do what they did here actually carry it out, actually follow through, actually make good on the commitments that have been made. It says in verse number 14 that they came and did work in the house. Again, the context of this passage is building God's house. That's where relationship with God happens. It's in God's house. It requires you to come to the job site if you're going to be a part of the building crew. And if you say, well, pastor, it seems like you've just been harping on and you've just been uh, uh, beating on church attendance. It's what's here. So you've got to come to the house if you're going to be a part of building the house, which is what I want you to do. You can't build the house if you're not at the house. And so, I, again, I realize I'm preaching to people who are in church. I get that. But the message is they came. They were there. They were present. That's the first step in the process. But not only were they present, it also says they came and did work and did work. One of the things that my mother taught me after I was saved as a teenager, uh, and I don't know why this phrase stuck out of my mind. She didn't use it harshly. She wasn't beating me over the head with it. But uh, the phrase that, that she would uh, throw out there said, you know, Andrew, you need to make sure, you know, you're saved, you're baptized, you're a member of the church now. You need to make sure you're not just a pew warmer. That phrase has always stuck with me. It's one thing to come to the job site. You picture a construction site and you've got the building materials sitting around and you've got the, the crew there and uh, there's actually some folks doing work on my neighbor's shed. And so I came out, uh, getting ready to come to the church office this week and got a whole crew of guys uh, there getting ready to start work for the day. And I was doing some things out in the yard before I left and I'm out there for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. There's a whole crew of people there. They came. There's no work being accomplished. 
They're telling jokes and they're drinking coffee and they're taking smoke breaks and uh, they had a good reason. They weren't just being lazy. But, but you understand my point. You can come to the house and not do work. And God's direction and, and what we see coming out of the people's lives here is it wasn't just that they came to the house. They did work. God wants you not just to show up to the job site. He wants you to be an active participant in what's happening in the building of his house. It is never God's plan for somebody just to uh, hang out and, quote, supervise what's going on in his house. It's for everybody to be there, to bring materials, to be a part of the building that is happening. You might wonder in verse number 15, why is this verse even here? It says that all this happened in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Look back at verse number one. It says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet. That's one of those things that, I'm guilty of this, we go through our Bible reading and you go through verses like that and it's almost like, all right, get me to where the actual story starts. I don't, second year of Darius, sixth month, I, who cares? God cares. That's who cares. And here's what we see in this final verse of this passage. God noticed... And God made note of, and God kept track of how long it took people to do what he told them to do. You remember, as you go through here, there are prophetic passages in the Bible where no time frame is attached to it. Yes, we went to the prophet Joel preached. Not a clue. Couldn't tell you. But in this account, and the message that God gave Haggai said, here's the day where I had Haggai preach that message to those people. And here's the date on the calendar where they listened and began to obey and began to construct the house. And so Haggai wasn't the one who has had a stopwatch. Haggai's not leaning over people's shoulders saying, hey, you don't start flossing. You got three more days and then those gums are gone. No, but God kept track. God knew how long it took him. And praise God, if you do the math here, I forget what I have on the, on the handout. It's about three weeks. About three weeks, Haggai preaches. He, he's used of God to sit people down in the dentist chair and say, listen, there's some things out of order in your life. There's some priorities that are out of whack. There's some things you need to fix. Here's how to fix it. And God took note. And God up in heaven had, the, had in his word recorded for all time three weeks. It took him 16 years from the building, from the laying of the foundation until this point. So it should have been finished a long time ago. But once Haggai preached, three weeks, they're back where they're supposed to be. They're building. And I simply want to challenge you and exhort you. I don't know what the area is in your life. I don't know what God's dealt with you about. I don't know what it is that uh, perhaps you used to do or, or where your work has stalled or where you're not doing what you once did. Don't do it on your timeline. Don't do it on your schedule. That's the whole thing in Haggai 1 is, is it time? It's not time. Is it time? What time is it? Is now a good time? God's keeping track. And the timeliness of your response to God's instructions communicates to God more than anything you say with your mouth. So it's one thing to tell God in prayer after a Sunday morning message or after a, a, a time of Bible reading, Lord, I'm going to definitely do this for you now. I'm going to recommit to do X, Y, and Z. I'm going to be a part of this ministry. I'm going to be a part of Saturday Outreach or Green Lake or whatever the case is. God says, okay, that's what you say. I'll take note when you actually start doing it. And it's not because God's cruel, but it's because actions speak louder than words. And God cares about your follow through. God cares about you uh, actually executing the commitments that you make to him. Now, I'll say again, as we finish up this morning, the specific commands that are addressed in Haggai 1 are in verse number 8, to go, to bring, and to build. And we've covered in previous messages the direct application that has to saints in a New Testament church. God's command to us, not me, all of us, are to go into all the world preach the gospel. Go ye and teach all nations. Bring to the house. We talked about this. We've got to go and chip away at somebody who needs to be in church. Chip away at somebody who needs to be saved. Chip away at somebody who needs to be baptized. Chip away at somebody who needs to be part of the church. Bring people to the house and then build as we're studying in Ephesians, to edify, to invest in people's spiritual growth, 
to build up other people so that God's church is built. That's the specific command. And so I would apply that to your life. Uh, Where are your priorities? Where are your uh, uh, schedule in relation to what God has on the calendar? When's the last time you were at Saturday Outreach or at Green Lake or any of the activities that we do throughout the week, handing out tracts in your personal schedule, uh, talking to people about Jesus Christ? Are you doing that on your schedule or on God's schedule? But the principle of dealing with sin in your life or of dealing with misprioritization in your life, it's not just about outreach. It's any area that God has in your life. And so, again, I'm not the dentist. I'm not here to diagnose. I would just say with Haggai, consider your ways. What has God pointed out to you where he says there's something messed up here? God sits us down in the dentist chair. It's not just on a Sunday morning in church. God will do that if you'll sit and read your Bible in the morning. God will do that if you'll listen to preaching. If you'll uh, spend time in God's word, God will sit you down and say, well, let's ask some questions. How are you doing in this area? You can let God examine you and God will tell you, here's how to fix that. Here's what to do about it. And the most important aspect of all that is actually responding like these people did. So when God says, consider, as he does twice in Haggai 1, be like this group of people. If you're a leader, if you're a parent, if you're a husband, if you're an employer, if you're someone who has some uh, supervision, some responsibility for others, lead the way. Say, all right, this has been out of order. We're going to fix it right now. As soon as that message is delivered, it's time to get to work on whatever it is that God has pointed out in your life. We're going to get the order right. You can't make your obedience to God contingent upon you getting to see God work in your life. These people didn't see anything until they first obeyed because they feared God. All they had was Haggai's message saying, do this and God will be pleased and God will be glorified. And that's all I can do. All I can say is here's what God's word says. Here's what pleases God and here's what glorifies God. I can't tell you what's going to happen after that. I can't tell you what's going to happen with your job. I can't tell you what's going to happen with your health. I can't tell you what's going to happen with your relationship. All I can tell you is the Bible says if you do this, God will be pleased. And God will be glorified. And when that's what's most important to us, God sees that. And God says, I'm with you. I'll provide the support you need. God can begin to stir. God begin to move. God can begin to do a work in your life. And and I would close simply by saying this. Once you've committed to obey God, once you've committed to uh, get the fear of the Lord the way that we should, follow through with it. It's so easy to uh, know that we need to do something. And maybe we're reminded of it every time we go to church. Every week I get that reminder Sunday morning. Oh yeah, I need to uh, make it to that uh, event. I need to make it uh, to be a part of that ministry. I need to get back in my Bible reading schedule. God says, follow through. Follow through. Timely manner. Took them three weeks. Come and do the work. And and I'm not trying to do math in public with the dates or anything like that. But if there's something that God's pointed out in your life, don't wait till the end of the month to do it. God's keeping track. Do it today. Do it right now. Do it tomorrow. And then do it again on Tuesday. And then do it again on Wednesday. Let God see, I'm serious about pleasing God and glorifying God. I'm going to obey Him because I fear Him. I love God, but I'm also afraid of what He's going to do if I disobey Him. Those two things are not in, in, uh, in opposition to each other. Those two things are in harmony. It's the same God. If I obey Him, He's, he's with me. He'll comfort. He'll supply. He'll enable. But I fear Him. That's the the relationship we should have with God. And he says, I am with you. They came, they did the work. God's house begins to be built.